The meeting of the Education and People Services Committee will please come to order. The district posted this evening's agenda to board docs at least 24 hours prior to the commencement of this meeting. Is there a motion to approve that previously posted agenda? So moved. Second. Thank you. Are there any amendments to offer? There are none. Okay. The agenda has been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying I oppose. Those abstaining, please signify by saying I abstain. Motion carried. I'm missing some content. Um, I'm going to hand the Education and People Services uh, agenda uh, and meeting over to Director War Savage. Thank you very much, President Fields. Uh, Dr. Kelly and Dr. Marshallick, would you mind going over the agenda items that we have? Uh, I was going to say up for bid um, on the list this evening, and you can go right into the first presentation if you'd be so kind. Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. So tonight we have four um, informational items on the Education and Pupil Services Committee meeting. Um, the first, I, uh, followed by policy. The first item is the Wellness Policy Annual Update. This is our annual presentation as described in Policy 246. The second item is a middle school college and career planning update. Um, this work will highlight, or this will highlight um, the work that is being done at the middle school to um, meet the career and education um, work standards. The third item is the Upper Darby School District Committee for uh, Student Safety and Well-Being, and the fourth item is the Title IX regulation updates um, that uh, Dr. Council and his team will be presenting, followed by our policies. So the first item is the wellness update. Um, as I said, this is in compliance with policy 246. And um, Dr. Brian Yersone and um, Mrs. Nina Tyre are here to provide the work that has been um, done in the 23-24 school year. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Good evening, Superintendent McGarry, Board President Fields, Vice President Williams, school board directors, administration, staff, students, and community members. This evening's report is focused on the work that has been done by our district's wellness committee. Our wellness committee consists of students, parents, community members, a member of the school board, district and building administration, UDEA staff, and Aramark staff. I want to take a moment to thank all of our committee members for the time that they gave up to be a part of this team. Thank you. During our wellness committee meetings, we focused on providing input to Aramark, our food service provider, created a wellness week for our students and staff, and our employee wellness initiatives. We would take time each meeting to try the same food that is prepared for our students and provide feedback to Aramark. We also created wellness week. This year it took place during the week of April 15th. At the elementary level, we had a color of the day and the color corresponded to a fruit or vegetable that the students were going to be served during breakfast or lunch. Additionally, there were daily announcements on the health benefits of eating fresh foods that contain these colors. We sent out communications to all district families, students and staff providing health, healthy snack recipes, and we encouraged our students and staff to engage in 10 additional minutes of a wellness activity each day of the week. We provided a list of wellness activities and the subsequent positive effects that each activity may have on a person's overall wellness. I'll now pass it over to Mrs. Nina Tyre, who will talk to you about our employee wellness initiatives. Hello. Uh, this year, we provided a number of wellness opportunities for our employees. Uh, the goal of the opportunities we provide is to make sure that all employees are able to access wellness, um, however it fits best into their, um, their life. So that may be through reading a well-being newsletter that's provided through the Health Trust. Our district is a part of the Delaware County Health Trust, and information is also shared through the Health Trust to the districts. Um, we also provided HUSC's mental health services, which allowed employees to access mental health services um, virtually. There's also HUSC nutrition counseling, which again, employees can access nutrition counseling virtually. Um, we also provided some of the Independence Blue Cross healthy lifestyle reimbursement opportunities, which included tobacco 
cessation, fitness reimbursement, and weight management reimbursement. Um, we also provided periodic awareness campaigns in October. We provided information about breast cancer awareness, and we also had a Wear Pink Day, uh, February Heart Health Month, uh, March Vision Awareness Month, and April Stress and Mental Health Awareness. Um, we also provided opportunities for people to go, our employees to go and get flu shots in October. Um, one of our uh, very popular initiatives is the Maintain Don't Gain initiative. Employees weigh in uh, around Thanksgiving and then weigh in again after they return after winter break. The goal is to remain within two pounds of your weight during the holiday season. We had 118 successful participants. Um, we offered biometric screenings to our staff, um, and we made sure that that took place during a uh, professional development day where employees had more flexibility within their day so that they could attend those screenings if they wanted to. Um, and then there was something called a preventative care campaign where employees, as long as they were going and getting um, preventative care such as uh, different types of age-related tests that they may need to have or uh, you know, seeing their family doctor or things like that, they could enter into a raffle to win prizes. Um, and finally, we had our spring walking challenge truck to the summit, which encourages employees to um, walk increasing number of steps um, throughout the four week challenge. And during that time, we also encouraged employees if they were able to, to go out and take a walk during National Walk at Lunch Day, which occurs every year at the end of April. Does anyone have any questions? I have a comment. I just wanted to say I really like the initiatives that are being put forth to the staff. Um, I do watch the emails to see what's happening. I wish I had gotten into that, that you know, the number of people that didn't gain weight, but I don't know if I did or not. But I do like the fact that we are um, considering our employees' health. So thank you for that. Yeah, I just, I just want to second uh, Director Murphy Morrissey's comments. It's a, it's a challenge to stay healthy, so I do appreciate uh, the work that you guys are doing. And it's a... Uh, it makes a better, uh, hopefully, it makes a better atmosphere uh, in the district that uh, the, the employees know their, their health is paramount to, to the administration and to, to the board. Thanks a lot. Any other commentary from board members? All right, seeing none, I believe we can move on to the next agenda item, please. All right, the second item is um, the middle school, college, and career planning update. Um, and Mr. Finch is going to make his way up. And as Mr. Finch makes his way up, I'm going to begin by reviewing the agenda for um, this presentation. So this is going to highlight the work that we are doing at the middle school to meet those standards for career and um, the career education and work standards or the CEW standards. Um, and throughout this agenda, I'm going to review the college and career readiness measures and why we are doing this work. And then Mr. Finch is going to take over and really go through what the middle school career day looked like and how our students um, took an interest profile and then walk through um, some other pieces um, through our Naviance software, which I will go through as well. He will finish by um, talking about some next steps and answering any questions that we may have. So the first piece of this is the why. So um, in 2018-2019, the Pennsylvania Department of Education um, implemented a career plans and portfolio requirements for um, school districts in the state of Pennsylvania, where they implemented, or they adopted the standards, the CEW standards, and then also um, had specific grade levels where students were collecting artifacts and students needed to meet these benchmarks um, as part of meeting the standards. So in grade five, where our first benchmark is, students had to complete or uh, collect evidence um, that they were meeting the standards in grades K through five with a real focus on grades three through five. In grade eight, there's another benchmark where students then had to um, collect another six pieces of evidence um, between the grades of six and eight, and including an individual career plan, which Mr. Finch is going to review with you um, as how we are meeting these, those standards in the uh, middle school level. 
And then at the end of this, in grade 11, the last benchmark, they were collecting an additional eight pieces of evidence um, in grades 9 through 11, and including two pieces of evidence that demonstrated that career plan was being implemented. So throughout this, they were co they're collecting these pieces of evidence um, to align those CEW standards. This artifact collection is also displayed on the Future Ready PA index um, when we review the data collection um, and we review what is displayed um, to the state or to the public through um, meeting these standards. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Finch, who's going to go through um, the middle school piece and how we are meeting those six pieces of evidence um, in grades six through eight, including that individual career plan. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Good evening, Superintendent McGarry, uh, Board President Fields, Co-Chairs War Savage and Williams, uh, Board Members and School Community. Now that we've heard from Dr. Kelly about the career readiness artifacts on the P Future Ready PA Index, I'm gonna highlight one avenue in which Upper Darby School District has students meet those artifacts, uh, which is our recent Middle School Career Day. I'll then discuss the results of one particular artifact that was collected during this event, the Career Interest Profiler. So on April 17th, Upper Darby School District held our second annual Middle School Career Day. The theme of this year's Career Day was Future Me. The school counseling department designed a day where each activity was designed to spark our students' personal reflection and career exploration. <clears throat> the goal of Career Day wasn't just to introduce our students to career options, but also encourage them to reflect on those interests and future aspirations, and then explore how they could translate into future careers. Additionally, as was said already, each activity was aligned to the career, education, and work standards um, from PDE. Teachers assisted students through these activities, ensuring that students completed the activities in Naviance, which is the career and college readiness platform that Upper Darby uses to track progress on those career, education, and work standards. Students completed activities that exposed them to uh, valuable career skills, viewed a presentation from Delaware County Technical High School, and completed and analyzed the results from the Career Interest Profiler on Naviance, the results of which I'm going to highlight today. Next slide, please. The Career Interest Profiler on Naviance is an online tool that assists students in understanding their strengths and preferences and guides them towards potential career paths and educational goals aligned with their identifying interest. The interest profiler is based on the Hollins model, which is used by the U.S. Department of Labor and Industry. The Hollins model, which characterizes students' interests into six personality types, realistic, investigative, artistic, social, enterprising, and conventional. Next slide. Uh, to take a closer look at the career cluster framework that this is built on, the way this works is students first take the career interest profiler, which is a 60-question interest inventory to get their career interest based on that Hollins model. They'll then get their Hollins trait. Then the National Career Cluster Framework takes over, and the Career Cluster flame, uh, Framework defines 16 career clusters, which are job groupings of related occupations with similar skill sets, interest, abilities, and activities. Each of the Holland's traits uh, that students are, uh, uh, find out about in their career cluster, the Career Interest Finder, are then mapped to a career cluster, and then those career clusters are taken out to uh, different career pathways uh, that the National Career Clusters Framework defines as well. Um, on the next slide, and I'm actually going to do a little trick here. I'm going to go to the slide after this one and then come back to this one. So we go to the next one. This is the uh, distribution of the Hollins traits for our middle school students that took the career interest profiler on this middle school career day. Um, so we can see the different percentages. Uh, we see enterprising, uh, the Holland's trade is at 25.6%, artistic is 22.7%, social is 17.9%, investigative is 14.1%, realistic 12.5%, and conventional 7.1%. What I should say is that what that means when I say our enterprising is 25.6%, that means 25.6% of our middle school students reported a top uh, Holland's trait of enterprising um, from this career interest profiler. Now, if we could go back one slide. 
and we can see what does that actually mean. So this would show a strong preference for leadership and creativity among students, uh, with 25.6 and 27.7 percent reporting a top Hollis trait of either enterprising or, artist or artistic. Uh, students with an enterprising trait tend to be very persuasive, ambitious, and energetic, and they enjoy leadership roles involving business and public speaking. Artistic students are creative and expressive students who prefer tasks involving art, design, music, or writing. Uh, those students value aesthetics and are very innovative. Uh, set with 17.9% of our students uh, having the top Holland's trait of social, that would indicate that those students excel in roles uh, involving working with others, such as teaching and counseling. Uh, the, uh, social students tend to be very empathetic and cooperative. With 14.1% of our students being classified as investigative, that would indicate that they are a very curious and analytical student who is interested in research and scientific activities. 12.5% of our students uh, had a top Hollis trait of realistic, which means they are practical and straightforward and they prefer hands-on activities. 7.1% of our students uh, were conventional. Uh, which indicates students that prefer uh, structured tasks and are detail-oriented. They excel in roles that require organization and clerical skills. Go to the next slide. The next, next and slide. The next, next slide, yes. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> uh, so moving forward, uh, for next steps, we're going to continue having students complete the interest profiler during future career days and uh, also in high school so they can continue to explore how their interests change over time. Additionally, we're going to use this profile information when planning work-based learning experiences and our PA Future Focused Career Exploration course um, to ensure that the experiences that we have available to students are aligned with the interests that they have. Uh, the school counseling department will also continue creating activities uh, that provide students with this reflective opportunity. And I really have to take a moment and highlight the hard work that was done by both uh, school counselors on this day and then also teachers for, um, you know, participating in these activities with the students. Uh, the job of a school counselor can be a very challenging one. Putting on an event this size with this many moving parts is a large undertaking. They did a very, very, very good job. I appreciate that. The day was very valuable to students. It was aligned to the career education and work standards and teachers were able to uh, assist as well and ensure that students completed those activities and got the most out of it. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, this opportunity to talk about this. Uh, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Uh, before we take it around the board, I actually wanted to make a brief comment, if that's all right. Um, I was just curious um, on two things. One, um, based on how that evaluation is formatted, are the questions like open-ended as the students answer them? Um, are they allowed? Are they basically allowed to explore the career interests, or are the questions kind of like focused in on? Okay, now we know what their skill set is. We're just going to continue drilling those questions. And second, are each of our students also provided their own individual pie chart to see where they fell on the spectrum of enterprising versus artistic in their responses. I was just curious. Yeah, it's, uh, those are great questions. So, um, yeah, so when the students do the career interest profiler, what it does is it actually ranks their Holland's choice for them. Okay, so it'll give them their top Holland's choice, which is what this uh, uh, we built this on, but then it also ranks their um, their other Holland's choices as well. So, and then on Naviance, they can go in and explore the career clusters, not just on their top Holland's choice, but they can explore them on all of them. Okay, so they can go in and explore all the different career clusters aligned with all six Hollands, and then um, in those career clusters. Uh, a career cluster is a grouping of job, uh, jobs and careers. They can go into those career clusters and explore careers out of that. So it's a pretty involved uh, uh, process. The US, it's based on, um, so Naviance, it's a Naviance product. It's based on the U.S. Department of Labor and Industry has a uh, program uh, that's a similar career interest profiler called ONET uh, that does the, uh, um, a pretty similar thing. Uh, yeah, so they can go in and they see all of their traits and explore all clusters. It doesn't, you know, kind of shoehorn them into one particular area. That is awesome and absolutely fascinating. Any other members from board or mm, any other comments from board members? Dr. McGarry? If there are no comments from the board, I just want to give a, a quick history on this. Those who have been, you know, tuning in for a number of years and on this board for a long time, 
this, you know, I appreciate James, the hard work. Thank you to the board for that position. Um, uh, I guess a week or two ago, uh, members of the board, we, I spoke at a legislative breakfast and I talked about mandates and the impact that mandates have on education. And this is great. I don't want to say this isn't a positive. It's positive that we're doing this. But this started in October of 2018. Uh, and just, just, this is a quick history lesson. So you go into our board docs, you can see a little history lesson. In 2013, the elementary and secondary education flexibility eliminated AYP, we thought. Went away from the SPP, the School Performance Profile, and Act 82. And in the fall of 2014, they changed the system again. They also changed the teacher evaluation system. They changed, changed the principal evaluation. And they were collecting uh, data on students. Under AYP, it went from 40 to 20 to under 11 and then back up to 11 again. If you had 11 of, uh, different types of students, the data began to be collected. And then in 2015, ESEA, Every Student Succeeds Act, becomes ESSA um, that requires even more information. And then the Fu PA Future Ready Index was adopted. So we went from AYP, SPP, to the PA Future Ready Index, all forward-facing public report cards in a matter of years for educators. What happened? More collection of student data put on teachers in classrooms and a huge cost. They also put more emphasis on standardized testing, uh, growth scores for English learners, high school graduation rates, percentages of four and five year cohorts were added. Chronic absenteeism was added back then. That's a new indicator that's come into play in schools. Um, and then gathering data on student career readiness. So we put a system in place overnight where we were asking middle school students and elementary school students to review. We had to change our schedule. I just want this history lesson, lesson to sink in. It caused a lot of tension and stress with our teachers. We had to change the schedule, find time in the school day, have students explore college and career uh, webinars and lessons in classes during the middle school and elementary school day. Then we had to collect that information, warehouse that information every single year all the way through the system, and then purchase Naviance and expand that all the way through the school district. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars just to be here today. So James gives an update uh, at a, a curriculum instruction meeting on Mondays. I had asked for another update on the success. So James, compliments to you and our wonderful guidance counselors in the district who do an awesome job. I want to say thank you for the presentation. But I do want people to understand, just to do this, just to get to where we are with this presentation today, is hundreds of thousands of dollars, hours of time taken away from other classroom parts, and it created a very difficult relationship where teachers feel that administrators are just pushing another thing into the classrooms to do, not understanding fully that these are decisions that are made overnight, outside, passing legislation. Not that it's not a good idea to explore these things, but it's time and energy and a data source, Naviance, that we have to collect and hold on to and store this information that gets then pushed out to PIMS. Uh, for our for the rating of our schools, so I just want everybody to understand this is six, seven, eight years in the making to get to this moment. Thank you very much, Dr. McGarry. And for those who do want to go back in time, you can go into board docs. All of that information is chronicled right there. Any other mem? Mm, there I go again. Any other commentary from board members this evening? All right, seeing none. I think we are ready for the third agenda item. The third agenda item for um, this evening is the committee um, that has been formed for student safety and well-being. Um, and this committee was formed as a result of working with UDEA leadership, um, the school board, um, at principals, and directors. And Dr. Manfrey, Dr. Yerson, and Mrs. Kelly Simone are going to take on this presentation for this evening. Good evening, Good evening everyone. Um, yes, as Dr. Kelly um, mentioned, this, this was born from a conversation that we had with uh, president uh, of UDEA, Linda Fox, as well as members of her executive committee who are actually here this evening, President Linda Fox and her three vice presidents, Donna Pulowski, Nick Coombs, and John Casertano. Uh, this team of people that we assembled um, it has already met on two occasions. Uh, and we're going to be talking to you this evening about what the goals and the, and the program and 
future considerations and action steps that we're going to take to ensure student and staff wellness and health and uh, continue our, our program of student management. So we're going to talk this evening about who are the members of this, of this team, of this committee, what the purpose is, as I said, the goals, action steps that we're going to be taking, and future considerations. <clears throat> and so the committee members are members from central administration, specifically Mrs. Simone, uh, Dr. Yerson, and, and me. Uh, we have principals and assistant principals who are members of the committee. And we have Upper Darby Education Association members and leadership. And again, I, I want to thank the leadership team for being here this evening, uh, a show of support for the work that we're going to be doing and, and for the team that we've assembled. It's really important to demonstrate that collaboration between UDEA and the administration. So what, what are we going to be doing? Uh, we're, we're going to be taking a look at K-12 student management. Uh, specifically, we want to make sure that, we're in sh that we are consistently uh, enforcing the code of character uh, as it is written from one year to the next across all grade levels, across all elementary schools, across the two middle schools, and that there is consistent enforcement of the code of character, and that we follow our process and procedures as it relates to student management and student discipline. Attendance, we want to make sure that we are continuing to uh, implement strategies, proactive strategies to pr improve attendance, which we have uh, uh, held in, in very, very high importance. Uh, we want to make sure that we are uh, continuing to address attendance with student attendance improvement plans that come out of Dr. Yerson's office, mental health. We want to examine and improve upon our mental health uh, program, including our trauma. Every single school in our district has a trauma-informed leadership team, our trauma teams, our restorative practice teams, and our social and emotional learning curriculum. We want to make sure that that, that is being delivered with fidelity uh, at all of our schools. We want to study the effects of social media on uh, student discipline and wellness. And Finally, and something that we're going to be talking about in the very near future, the, the use of cell phones in schools and the impact that that may have on student management. In particular, I wanted to mention tonight, thank you to Mrs. Pulaski who provided me with this, this article, that there is a member of the House of Representatives uh, in, the, in the state legislature uh, who has uh, introduced Bill 2034, which would ban possession and use of cell phones. And it's my understanding that uh, there's also such a bill being proposed by the, the Senate. Um, where that goes, I don't know. Uh, but it is a, a very interesting topic that we've been discussing uh, as a team. And uh, hopefully, we'll continue to discuss uh, well into the, the summer. Thank you, Dr. Manfrey. Uh, the goals of this committee were developed collaboratively amongst UDEA leadership and district administration in order for all committee members to have a period. I kind of blew right by that. Uh, we did this so, um, you know, we could all be on the same page and work together for the, the same outcomes. Um, in order for all committee members to have a similar understanding of student rights, we front-loaded reading materials for our committee members including language on court cases such as Mahanoy Area School District versus BL and Flaherty versus Keystone Oaks School District. Additionally, we'll be reaching out to Fox Rothschild to present to our committee on the implications of these decisions and laws as it pertains to student discipline. We will look at our current approaches to Tier 1 as it relates to student management and evaluate our current practices and move forward any potential recommendations. This group will work together to develop plans on how we can ensure consistent dispositions across buildings and grade levels. We will review communication plans between our building level administrators and UDEA staff and see how our student information system can support these efforts as it relates to student management. And those are the crux of our goals for this meeting. I'll now turn it over to Mrs. Simone to discuss the action steps and future considerations. 
Thank you, Dr. Sun, and good evening, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Manfrey mentioned, uh, we did hold uh, two meetings, one on May 21st and one actually this evening, earlier this evening, specifically focusing on policy 237. These meetings were essential as we concentrated on this policy regarding electronic devices at the request of UDEA or UDM. This focus was also crucial to meet the timeline for necessary policy revisions. We are hoping for a first reading of the proposed revisions of policy 237 at the June 4th meeting, followed by the second reading and board adoption on June 18th. Policy 237 has significant implications for our community. To better understand these implications and gather feedback, we will be conducting a parent survey. This survey will provide an opportunity for families to share their thoughts and it will be distributed in tomorrow's Wednesday message. Our goal is to ensure that any necessary changes are communicated effectively to all vested parties before the start of the 2024-2025 academic year. We aim to prepare and implement these revisions so that all students, staff, and families are well informed. It is important to note that the code of character does not require board approval, allowing us to make timely adjustments as needed. Looking ahead, there are several future considerations we need to keep in mind. We will continue to, with open lines of communication between UDA and the administrative team. This ongoing dialogue is crucial for ensuring that we address concerns and collaboratively improve our policies. There will be an ongoing evaluation of policy 237 concerning electronic devices to ensure it meets the needs of our students and staff. As part of that evaluation process, uh, we do plan to administer a staff survey. Similarly, we will evaluate the code of character at each level on an ongoing basis. This continuous review will help us maintain a positive and respectful environment across all of our schools. This concludes our presentation this evening. We want to thank our board for this opportunity, and we also want to thank our UDA leadership and members and our administrative team for the ongoing partnership and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful presentation and the collaboration between our teachers, our paid professionals, and our administrative team is always uh, just a really nice, pleasant thing to see. Any other, or mm, let me do that again, any comments from board members at this time? Thank you so much for putting together this committee and for those who are participating. I think it's something that's obviously very needed, especially to keep the lines of communication open. So thank you. I, I did have a comment um, specifically about the portion of the presentation that uh, speaks to the parent survey. I know that historically uh, participation in surveys uh, tends to be low, so does the administration have any concerns uh, about the feedback that they would get? Uh, also, um, in, the converse, in these ongoing conversations to address student safety and well-being, are we working currently within the parameters of what our budgetary constraints happen to be? Because I have a feeling that the potential to do a whole lot more would increase if we had even more funding. Um, and I hope the state is listening to this presentation right now. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to ask um, was, do we have the capacity, say, we implement some kind of a uh, cell phone use policy or non-use or whatever that looks like. Um, do we have the capacity to be able to monitor and police that? Um, what's the administration and the teacher's view on that? Just curious. So I, after we had an informational session with the board, I'd asked and met with uh, UDA leadership and they filed back up and asked me to form this committee with the team. And I think right out of the gate with your first question. Um, I think everybody here, the board included, is at their capacity probably for, for the amount of work that goes on. There aren't enough people to oversee these things. In some ways, uh, a self-handling and addressing the cell phones could be considered like the Cabbage Patch cards or Pokemon cards of you know 2024 uh, or the dress code policy issues that we had at one time. The big difference uh, were fidget spinners when they first came out. That was the end of the world, too, uh, originally. But there's a difference here with the cell phone. It, it 
the social media and the cell phones, trying to control that environment in the school day as much as possible could cut down and eliminate the added pressure and stress on our kids that happens in the buildings. Uh, there was an article from the Netherlands where they're banning cell phones in the Netherlands today that came out. Um, other school districts moving in this direction. It's going to be a lot of work, Damien. There's no question about it. The administrators are probably going to be at their wits end. Uh, so I think the recommendations will be to hopefully phase this in elementary, middle, and then work its way into the high school um, so that there's kind of a rotation for that. Uh, that would be something I would hope uh, to have happen. The survey part, um, I had recommended to, to the team to put a survey out there. There are some board members who have asked me, do we do a surveying or we get enough surveying out there? Do I think we'll get a lot of results on this one? Probably when we communicate this out, we will because kids will be concerned about it. Um, we'll get some feedback from them on it. But I think it's good data and a way to get out communication that this is happening, that it's not just all of a sudden overnight that we're going to potentially move in this direction. We do have a board policy that's obviously on there, 237, um, that talks about electronic communication devices and how to handle it. Some school districts have gone out, to your point, and spent millions of dollars on pouches to collect cell phones. Um, I do not think that's a direction we're going to go in. Um, I don't want this to cause more discipline. That's part of my concern, too, is that when there's a conflict with kids with their earbuds in or a conflict with kids who don't give their cell phone up willingly, it shouldn't be a wrestling match to get them either. It should be a conversation, and we work with families to try to, try to address that. I don't know that it's going to be an easy lift, um, but I do think in hearing from teachers and talking to kids, it's a, it's a concern in the district uh, how much the cell phones come into play. So right now, we're not looking to add anything to the budget for that, but there is a mental capacity uh, and a workload that I think this, that will come with this from the administration and the teachers. And potentially, when you initiate these kinds of plans, I hope the teachers union continues to work with us where they understand that we're doing our best. I'm going to do my best to say this right now, too. It's, it's a relationship. We need parents and the school and the community to continue to work together to talk to one another about you're in school for these reasons and, and putting that cell phone away. It's got to be that collaborative home and school type of situation. So this will be a discussion point again with our district home and school to help push out that message of support too. Thank you for that perspective, Dr. McGarry. Any other feedback from board members? Seeing none, I believe we are ready for the next agenda item. Um, the fourth um, agenda item is the U.S. Department of Education Title IX Regulations Update. And Dr. John Council, Mrs. Kamisha Simpson, and Mrs. Wendy Elgard are heading this way um, to review um, some changes that have occurred in the Title IX regulations um, that came about in April of 2024. So Dr. Council is here with his team, and they're going to present to us these changes. Good evening, President Fields, uh, members of the board, Dr. McGarry, and members of the community. Uh, as Dr. Kelly mentioned, uh, joining us this evening is uh, Ms. Kamisha Simpson. Ms. Simpson serves as our Title IX coordinator, as well as uh, Ms. Wendy Elgert, uh, who also who serves as our deputy Title IX coordinator. Uh, together, we will provide updates uh, to the regulations enforced in Title IX. Uh, which was originally signed into law in 1972. That would mean that uh, as of now, it's more than uh, 50 years, uh, that was more than 50 years ago that that law was enacted. Uh, on April 19th, on April 19th, 2024, the U.S. Department of Education issued uh, what they call the final Title IX regulations govern governing uh, sex discrimination complaints involved in educational uh, institutions. The amended regulations, which were uh, more than uh, 1,500 pages, uh, they clarify terms, expand the geographical scope of Title IX, uh, amend the investigation pro process, allowing for a high level of flexibility for the, uh, grievance, uh, the grievance process, and include sexual orientation, gender identity, and pregnancy-related protections. Uh, we have, as a district, up until August 1st, 2024, to update our policies and train staff on the new Title IX requirements. The amended regulations, regulations also known as the final regulations, expand the scope regarding the definition of sex-based discrimination and sex-based harassment, including our obligation as a district not to discriminate based on sex stereotypes, sex characteristics, sexual orientation, gender identity, pregnancy or related conditions, and peer retaliation as listed on the screen. 
Uh, the final regulations, they strengthen protections uh, from all forms of sex-based harassment, including sexual violence and unwelcome sex-based conduct that creates a hostile uh, environment by limiting or denying a person's ability to participate in or benefit uh, from our school's education program or activity. Uh, the new uh, regulations were enacted, enacted to strengthen protections against sexual harassment and discrimination and prevent its reoccurrence and remedy its effects. Wendy. The final regulations define hostile environment harassment as unwelcome sex-based conduct that, based on the totality of the circumstances, is subjectively and objectively offensive and is so severe or pervasive that it limits or denies a person's ability to participate in or benefit from the recipient's education program or activity. The 2020 amendments covered sexual harassment but did not address other forms of sex-based harassment. The 2020 amendments prohibit unwelcome sex-based conduct only if it is so severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive that it effectively denies a person equal access to the recipient's education program or activity. The expanded definition of hostile environment captures behavior that is severe or pervasive, which may allow for more cases to be considered in the Title IX category, taking into account the totality of circumstances. In the new regulations, pregnancy-related protections are specifically designed to protect students, employees, and applicants from discrimination based on pregnancy, childbirth, lactation, related medical conditions, or recovery from these conditions. The final regulations also require that when a student, a parent of a minor student, or other authorized legal representative informs a school employee of a student's pregnancy or related conditions, the employee must then provide the individual with information about the school's obligations to prevent discrimination and ensure equal access by providing reasonable modifications. One of these modifications is a break time for lactation, and access to a lactation space that is private, free from intrusion, and cannot be a bathroom. Policy 234, Pregnant Married Students, will be reviewed by the Administrative Policy Group to ensure policies reflect the changes from the Title IX uh, final rule of 2024. Good evening. The Title IX Final Rule of 2024 prohibits discrimination and harassment based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex characteristics in federally funded education programs. The rule expands the regulations protections for LGBTQIA students, employees, and others. The amendments are centered around protecting people from harm when they are separated or treated differently based on sex in school. The final regulations further recognize that preventing someone from participating in school, including in sex separate activities, consistent with their gender identity causes that person more than de minimis harm. This is the first time this explicit protection against sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination has been formalized in Title IX regulations. The final regulations clarify that a school must not separate or treat people differently based on sex in a manner that subjects them to more than de minimis harm, except in limited circumstances permitted by Title IX. The final regulations further recognize that preventing someone from participating in school, including in sex separate activities consistent with their gender identity causes that person more than de minimis harm. This general non-discrimination principle applies except in the limited circumstances specified by the statute, such as in the context of sex-separate living conditions and sex-separate athletic teams. The final regulations do not include new rules governing eligibility criteria for athletic teams. Athletics within Title IX is being looked at for further guidance within the regulation. This slide highlights several key changes aimed at improving the efficiency, accessibility, and effectiveness of Title IX procedures. Written and verbal reports will now serve as triggers for initiating the grievance process. This adjustment simplifies the process, making it more student-friendly for complainants, especially within K-12 spaces. Another important update is the option to return to the single investigator model. 
This means that the decision maker in the grievance process may now serve as the investigator or the Title IX coordinator, providing us with more flexibility in handling complaints. This expansion of the span of jurisdiction demonstrates the Department of Education's commitment to creating a safe and inclusive environment for all. Regardless of where the conduct occurs, once the conduct is creating a sex-based hostile environment, it should be reviewed under the Title IX policy. Schools are required to offer supportive measures, if needed, to complainants as well as to respondents, whether or not a formal complaint has been filed, which was something our district has adhered to since 2020. The regulation revisions also allows for a voluntary informal resolution of complaints at any stage. A formal complaint to initiate informal resolutions is no longer needed, except that informal resolutions can never be allowed if complaints allege an employee engaged in sex-based harassment of a K-12 student. The final rule of 2024 will have significant implications for various policies within our organization. Among these policies, 103, 104, and 234 are the immediate priorities, requiring attention and potential revisions by August 1, 2024. Our internal protocols will be adjusted to align with the new guidelines established by the Department of Education, taking into consideration the introduction of the single investigator model. To ensure a comprehensive understanding of the changes brought forth by the Title IX fi Final Rules 2024, external counsel will conduct a specialized training in July for all district administrators to provide them with a thorough overview of the rules impact on school districts. Additionally, all staff members will be required to complete the updated Vector Safe Schools training to ensure compliance with the revised regulations and to maintain a safe and inclusive and educational environment for all students. The information presented today was compi compiled from various sources, such as ASPA, the American Association of School Personnel Administrators, ATICSA, the Association of Title IX Administrators, and the U.S. Department of Education's Final Rule of 2024. Thank you. At this time, do we have any questions? Kamisha, John, great, great job, Wendy. Thank you. Um, again, I want to just reiterate, um, this change is occurring again overnight. It's about a 1500 page document that was just changed. If uh, board member Des Noyres recalls the amount of work that went into the original changes to the policy and the amount of time and effort that went to get us up and running for the, the changes to Title IX. Most recently, Title IX just changed again. It's very controversial, these changes. There are many school districts here in Pennsylvania and around the country that are ignoring these changes and waiting for uh, either an injunction, uh, Beth, I know that you're aware of it, or a lawsuit to challenge the change of uh, the Title IX regulations. Um, it does further complicate the handling of some of this work. And in, in the past, there was a formal complaint process. There is no longer a formal complaint process. Off-campus behavior, um, so example, you could be out of state and there could be students who went on a vacation together. Something could occur out of state on vacation over the weekend and then if something were to come up in school, we would be obligated under this Title IX to investigate a behavior out of state on a vacation that's not at a school sanctioned event. So I just want you to understand that off campus behavior that was there is not as if it's off campus school sanctions, it's off campus summer, weekend, holiday, whatever it is. If it gets brought up in school, then there's an investigation and it could be an out of state vacation. That was the example that was given in the training that Kamisha, Wendy, John and I most recently attended. So this is some heavy stuff. It's complicated. Um, but again, it's become political. And I think the board needs to be very aware that the administration's recommendation to the board in this presentation, there's a reason for this presentation publicly as well. We are going to post this on the website um, as an update. We will probably push this out to the public as well. So the public's aware of the changes. There are requirements of school districts to notify the public by August the 1st of these changes. We are doing that by tonight. We will push this out. We will train our administration, God bless you, by January, uh, July the 11th. And then uh, board member Des Noyers, myself, Ms. Simpson, um, uh, and uh, Kyle, our solicitor, will be racing to update the board policy Hopefully, we can have the board policy updated before students are back in session. They're pretty key highlights, just to review them again. A public presentation, which we did tonight, 
publishing this information on our website and pushing this out, notifying the public as a requirement of these Title IX changes, obviously then some policy changes, and internally as an administration, do we go away from our current process where we do not have a single investigator making the outcome, and we have layers to that because in the original process there was a concern of bias in making the outcome determination, and we don't, I don't believe we're gonna go away from the current process that we have as far as that's concerned. But we'll provide that update to the board. Board just wanted you to know that why we're giving this presentation, there were changes. It's about a 1500 page change. Um, and we have to make public notice prior to August the 1st. Thank you very much, Dr. McGarry. Any other feedback from board members? Seeing none, I think we are ready for the final agenda item. The final agenda item are our policies, which um, have gone through a first reading, and Mr. Desnoyers are now ready for uh, going for board action for a June committee meet or June board meeting. Excuse me. Uh, so there are um, two policies on the agenda for this evening's meeting. There have been no changes since the May 14th board meeting. These changes will need to be moved forward by the board at this meeting and approved at a subsequent board meeting to take effect. The policies, implement, the policies impacted are policy 206 attachment, assignment within district, and uh, policy 815, acceptable use of internet, computers, and network resources. Uh, so, sorry about that. Um, a brief summary of the policy 206 attachment changes are the policy to attach, sorry, the policy 206 attachment details school assignments for all addresses in the district. The policy 206 attachment is being updated to reflect the fact that, as discussed during the April 30th, 2024 Education People Services Committee in-person virtual meeting and beginning with the 24-25 school year, Aronimink Elementary School will serve students in kindergarten through first grade and not first through fifth grade. Please note that there are no changes to policy 206 language at this time. The only changes being considered are changes to the policy 206 attachment. And the updates to policy 815, a summary uh, is as follows. Um, there has been an update since the April 9th uh, 2024 first reading of policy 815 that was reviewed at the um, <clears throat> uh, May 14th uh, board meeting and this in introduced item number 17 in the prohibition section uh, which prohibits audio or visual recording of an individual in a classroom setting without that individual's permission. Uh, so the, the other changes, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, policy 815 is also being updated to incorporate changes suggested by both PSBA and the district. Uh, these, the, the summaries of policy changes are posted to board docs and the full policies with um, changes indicated are posted to board docs. That concludes my update. Thank you very much, Director Desnoyers. Any feedback from board members at this time? All right, seeing none, I believe now we are at the time for public comment. As a reminder, if you would like to make comment, we take priority for those present first, then email and phone in comments. Please come to the mic, announce your name, your address, and the specific agenda item that you would like to make comment on. Do we have any takers in public? John Cannon, 132 North Glenwood Avenue, Clifton Heights. Um, I think my question is, is mainly for you, Dr. McGarry, because everyone, th three of these programs that were talked about tonight, in essence, uh, are mandated and expensive. 
Uh, you mentioned some school districts spend millions of dollars. It's not something that we have at the drop of the luxury of, of uh, going to the money tree out front and grabbing a million dollars off of. In your estimation, those three programs, total cost, and I ask this so that any parents uh, or community members listening in tonight will contact their representatives. Things like mandatory no cell phones in the schools that cost one. Uh, in your estimation, what do those three programs burden our school district uh, in terms of cash? Well, I'll start with the most recent one, the Title IX. Um, the Title IX requires a Title IX coordinator. And so we had to shift administrative responsibilities and add an administrative position to help oversee that, that department. Um, and that also adds on to other administrators in the district. So it's an, adi an additional administrative responsibility and job, plus additional administrative jobs to the current assistant principal. So, you know, ballpark, that's, that's, a, that's a couple hundred thousand dollar change right there. Just the one, just the one movement and the amount of people and time and effort into that. Um, when you talk about the cost related to um, implementing Naviance and the collection of artifacts, um, we had to shift schedules around um, and we had to change the middle school schedule probably three or four times in a short period of time to make space in the schedule. Had to give teachers, ask teachers to give up their prep time to be able to do that. There's a cost to teacher subs and coverages as a result of that because they're now before had middle school teaming. The middle school teaming went away and they had to pick up additional section of classes to run. Um, some would argue there's a cost savings there, but there's not a cost savings because the teachers then call out because they're covering so many classes. So a voucher in the district is anywhere between $25 to $45 for a coverage each time a teacher is out to cover an additional class that didn't exist previously. Um, that's probably another $100,000 to $200,000 or more a year easily in coverages at different levels. That's just per, per building probably. Um, and then when you talk about the additional increase of Naviance, Naviance uh, off the top of my head is a couple hundred thousand dollar a license agreement. Uh, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I know it's it's over two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. I believe for Naviance, it's a per pupil cost. So that's uh, an ongoing annual cost. That's just the software that we have to implement to collect the data and have students uh, in that. It usually was a software only used for juniors and seniors uh, getting out of uh, uh, high school. Now it's a software that we're using all the way through the school district to collect these artifacts. And in Upper Darby, to your point. I made this comment the other day about the solar eclipse. Some school districts had home and schools cover the solar eclipse. The solar eclipse for us was about a $9,000 30-minute cost just to get solar glasses for kids out of nowhere. So here, when it's a per-pupil expense, even at $1.50 or $2, and some of the software now is up to $14 a child for this type of licensing, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we're close to probably somewhere between $500 Six hundred thousand dollars a year in just these changes. I, I, sure. And how much has the legislature uh, provided in funding to cover that five hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I think we're lucky here in Upper Darby historically, and definitely right now, uh, Representative Curry, Representative Boyd, and Senator Carney advocate all the time for our school district. I, I couldn't ask for more help. Uh, I got a little upset the other night. I attended a meeting at the township where there was a they were hosting a talk on the budget, and I heard all good of intentions. There was a conversation, unfortunately, where a state rep was saying they're going to bring a new program to school districts. They're going to require us to do something with students in school. And I turned to Don Fields and I said, "Oh my gosh, when somebody at a legislative thinks it's a great idea, and I think the intentions are great, and they say we're going to have schools do it, and it won't be a cost." Just remember, anytime we take time away from what we're already doing in the school day to shoehorn something else in for a teacher, there's a cost associated with that. The problem is decisions about education are being made by non-educators. It's driven by politics and a bill. Uh, we just heard about two house bills that are an idea. I was on a phone call two or three weeks ago about the late start. That's a, that's a multiple million dollar change. If the, Pennsylvania says kids have to sleep in later, it's about a two to $3 million cost. These are the kinds of decisions that are being made without kind of our direct input as educators. We're lucky here that our state reps and our senators do reach out and we do have those kind of conversations and they support us, um, but there isn't any funding to many of these unfunded mandates. 
little to no funding because they think we can just fit it in. Um, and that's the problem because they're not really asking educators before they happen. Any other public comment for those present? All right, seeing none, Director Buford, do we have any email or phone in comments by chance? No, we do not have any email or voicemail questions. All right, wonderful. All right, Dr. Kelly, Dr. Marshallick, would you mind going over the agenda items one more time? Sure. Um, so the first agenda item was the wellness policy annual update, um, which was, um, of course, our annual presentation um, as described in policy 246, which um, highlighted the accomplishments um, of the wellness committee for the 23-24 school year. That was an informational item. The second item was also informational. Um, Dr. Er, sorry, uh, Mr. James Finch um, highlighted the work that was done with the middle school students in collecting their artifacts and exploring um, their interests and career paths using the um, career education work standards or the CEW standards. Again, that was an informational item. The third item was a um, was the Upper Darby School District Committee for Safety, Student Safety and Well-Being. Um, Dr. Manfrey, Dr. Yersone, and Mrs. Simone um, presented the goals of this committee and the work that's going to continue to be done um, for the 24-25 school year. And then the fourth I informational item, sorry. And then the fourth item were the um, new regulations um, under Title IX that uh, Dr. Counsel, Ms. Kamisha Simpson, and Mrs. Wendy Elgard highlighted um, as that work continues through this school year. Informational again. Wonderful, and I believe now I will pass the meeting back. Oh, policies, sorry, Doc, uh, Dr. DeSnoyers, Director DeSnoyers. Yeah, just that the two policies um, are uh, board action required. Do we have a consensus on moving those forward? Yes. 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 Thank you very much for the catch, Director DeSnoyers. And with that being said, I pass the meeting back over to President Fields. A, uh, a motion is, is in order for the adjournment of the Education and People Services Committee meeting. So moved. Second. This meeting is adjourned.